The title of my talk, as Alessandro already mentioned, is Viral and Host Factors of HCV Replication. And since I expected not to find many HCV specialists here, I will start with a broader introduction and I try to, to get you back into the details with uh, some, some more broader conclusions uh, in between. So HCV causes hepatitis C. Um, it's a virus belonging to the family of Leviviridae. Um, although it's not very uh, closely related to, uh, to the classical flaviviruses. It's an enveloped viral particle of a typical diameter of 50 to 80 nanometer. It has taken years or, or let's say decades to make pictures of this virus because it's hardly be concentrated uh, from, from human serum and also uh, not very highly concentrated in cell culture. It, at the moment, the model is like uh, that it looks like a classical virus, but it's also part of a VLDL, uh, so of a, of a cellular uh, large molecular complex, and also uh, contains a lot of cellular proteins like ApoE, ApoLipoproteins. So it's enveloped, it has enveloped glycoproteins, it has, of course, a capsid and a positive strand RNA molecule of about 9.6 kilo bases in length. One hallmark of this virus, and I'll come ba back later to that, is its high genetic variability, and that's a real problem in generating a vaccine, for example. There is no vaccine in sight, uh, and I think the, the chances are bad to, to get something, and also for uh, therapy development, of course. Uh, it has a high prevalence, so it's expected that 170 million people worldwide are infected with HCV. Um, and the problem with HCV is um, not that all the people are dying from it, that but that, but that, and it's very unusual for a positive strand RNA virus that most of the people get into a chronic infection. So about 80% of HIV infected patients get into chronicity. Most of the RNA, positive strand RNA virus have a hit and run strategy. So you get sick, probably you die, but uh, if you don't die, you uh, release uh, the virus, so the virus is gone. In this case, the virus persists lifetime, for the lifetime, and in many cases, you de develop over the years and decades uh, severe chronic liver disease like cirrhosis or even hepatocellular carcinoma. Uh, there is a therapy which is pegylated interferon and ribavirin, which is effective in about 50% of cases. Nowadays, so starting, I think, from last month or uh, in, in spring, there is now also a direct antiviral approved at, in addition to this therapy, which increases the efficiency of therapy to, let's say, 80%. It's a protease inhibitor. Um, and there are many, many uh, um, kind of uh, clinical studies on the way to develop further antiviral drugs and so direct anti acting antivirals. And the therapy based on that will be available probably in the next five years, which will probably dramatically increase uh, um, uh, the cure rate uh, for this virus. So as I mentioned, it's a positive strand RNA genome, uh, which encodes uh, a lo one long polyprotein of about 3,000 amino acids in length. Uh, this is flanked, it's one open reading frame, it's flanked by a non-translated region at the 5' and 3' UTR. It has an internal ribosomal entry site, so no cap at the 5' end, which is required for translation. And this polyprotein is then processed by cellular in the N-terminus uh, or viral proteases uh, into its functional subunits, which are depicted here. All of them are associated to membranes or are even membrane proteins. Uh, in the end terminus of the polyprotein, we have the, let's say, the assembly module, all the proteins which are required uh, for virus assembly. And in the C terminus, we have the proteins which are required for RNA replication, the, which form the replication complex. So we have core, which ma makes the capsid, E1, E2, the structural proteins in the envelope. P7 and NS2, uh, P7 is an ion channel, which is important for assembly. Uh, NS2 is a protease, which cleaves between NS2 and NS3, which also is important more for assembly than for replication. NS3 is a bifunctional uh, enzyme, a protease, together with a cofactor NS4A. And this is the protease where the current, uh, currently approved drugs are directed against, the NS3 protease. And then the C-terminus, we have a helicase, which is also required for RNA replication, but nobody clearly knows at which, at which step. NS4B induces membrane alterations, which harbor the replication complex. I'll come to that in a, in a minute. NS5A is a regulatory phosphor protein. It binds RNA. It's important for RNA replication. The mechanisms are not clear. I'll come to that in the second uh, part of the talk. Uh, and it has a role in assembly, which has been found a couple of years ago. 
And NS5B is a key enzyme of our replication, the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. That's an enzyme that's not found in a cell. It, the virus has to bring it by itself. The cell only has DNA-dependent RNA polymerases. A short view on the replication cycle. The entry step is quite complicated. Uh, we already know at least four uh, receptor molecules. Uh, CD81 is the most important, uh, probably, and uh, has been uh, found uh, earliest uh, by Sergio Abignani in Italy, in Siena at that time. Um, SRB1 is also very important, and claudine and occludine has been uh, identified in recent years by the RICE lab. There are tight junction proteins. All these four molecules are essential for virus entry. Entry is then uh, mediated by receptor-mediated antisitosis. The RNA gets released in the cytoplasm from the viral uh, capsid. How this process uh, goes is not, not very clear yet. Then it's translated into the polyprotein, and this proteins then induce membrane alterations. They are designated membrane as web. It's accumulation of vesicles. I'll come to that in this, on the next slide in more detail because this is the center of my interest, actually. And within these vesicles, it's believed that the RNA replication takes place. So the positive strand is transferred into a negative strand, and this gives rise to novel positive strands, which are then assembled into virions or, pack, uh, or go into a, a new replication cycle. So just a, a word on assembly. Um, it's, again, very complicated. Not much is known about that. It's heavily associated to lipid droplets. So cellular lipid droplets seem to play a major role in this. Um, and uh, as I already mentioned, the virus particle seems to get loaded by a lot of cellular lipids or even be part of a VLDL particle which is then secreted by the regulatory secretory pathway. But the details of this process are not well understood, besides the fact that the core is very, uh, decorates always lipid droplets. But, but the molecular details are not, uh, not well known. So coming now in more detail to the replication complex and the step from translation to replication. So as I already mentioned, uh, the RNA is translated. We generate a huge amount of uh, non-structural protein copies. Uh, we quanti quantified that. It's really millions per RNA. We have a huge excess of proteins. And these proteins then form, uh, uh, um, form membrane alterations. You see this in IF pictures as dot-like structures. You'll see that on several IF pictures during my presentation. And these dot-like structures, if you, if you think how this looks in EM, we find this kind of membrane alterations, which are in accumulations of vesicles which are called membrane as web. And we think that one of these dots represents this, such an accumulation of vesicles. And when you now look at the molecular composition of such a vesicle, this is depicted here, but that's only a model, I have to, uh, um, have to say. So we think it's covered, I think it is, that's here, by many, many copies of the non-structural proteins. This is, was part of this uh, quantitative an analysis. Several hundred copies of the proteins are in there. We have a limited amount of negative strand because we only find, let's say, 100 to 1,000 negative strand RNA molecules per cell, which means not each of these vesicles can harbor a replication complex. Um, so this is a very limited component and a couple of copies of positive strand RNAs. Um, we furthermore found biochemic, biochemical studies, and this suggests that it's a vesicular structure. There has to be an opening because NTPs, nucleotides, have to get in for RNA synthesis. And biochemically, we, uh, it's protected from, uh, from proteases and nucleases, so there seems to be a membrane shield shielding which, which protects the RNA from degradation and the proteins. And it's a detergent-resistant membrane compartment. Um, this model is also in part derived from EM studies, which have, has been done in Ralph Bartenschlager's lab on a related virus, which is dengue virus. Uh, where he made uh, Ralph and um, together with his co-workers make, made a very uh, dedicated st a study on the replication complex um, of dengue virus. And here you see uh, these vesicular structures, which are which are invaginations from the ER membrane, and which indeed had an opening uh, where the uh, uh, RNA get, can get out. And this is a picture where the RNA is packaged into virion. So whenever you have some spare time, uh, I can only uh, advise you to have a look at that paper and the movies in this paper. It's really nice. Um, in case of dengue virus, these structures are very clear and um, uh, kind of um, uh, distinct. In HCV, it's much more difficult. And this is a more recent work of Ines romero Bry in Ralph Bartenschlager's lab looking at an EM picture of a virus-infected cell early after infection, 16 hours. And at that time, you see already large number of double membrane vesicles, 
So they don't seem to don't have an opening, and we don't know what their role in replication is. It's just that the, a, a lot of them are there. Um, we have um, swollen ER structures and invaginations of the ER, which come closest to the model I presented to you before. And when you look at later time frames, it's getting even more complicated in having multi-membrane vesicles, uh, even more double-membrane vesicles. So you see the entire cell is full of membrane alterations induced by the virus infection. But we, at the moment, have no clear idea how to link these different complex structures to viral replication. Uh, and Alessandro spends a lot of his time in uh, visualizing viral RNA, and that's also a big issue in, in, in HCV. It's really hard to see where the RNA is and in which of this vesicle really replication goes on, particularly on the sub, uh, substructural level. So there's still a lot of work to do in, in this regard. Um, in my talk, I will focus on, on two aspects. First of all, the cell culture models of HCV, and in the second part, I will uh, spend some time on, a, uh, on host factors in general, in particular on one, on one lipid kinase, which we identified in a, as RNA screen, which is an important host factor of HCV replication. So coming to the cell culture models, as I already mentioned, um, this picture only depicts six uh, genotypes. We now have seven genotypes. We have a high variability of the viral genome. Genotype one is the most important in terms of disease. So most people are infected with genotype one, and it's the most difficult to treat. With IFN-based therapy, it's only 50%. With the new antivirals, probably uh, it's, it will get better. Um, and between these genotypes, we have 30% nucleotide difference. Uh, uh, that's a really a lot. You know, we have 97% uh, percent identity with chimpanzees. Uh, so even between the subtypes, it's really a huge variability. And um, even within a, uh, uh, one genotype, we have 20 to 25% nucleotide difference uh, between subtypes. Um, and uh, we have no way at the moment, and even after 20, 10, 20 years of research, to transfer this variability into cell culture. So what you typically do as a virologist is you take the serum of an infected patient, you put it on a cell which you think might be infectable, and then you look what happens, and you hope that the virus will infect the cells. And this is what we did here. We just took sera of a couple of patients. Um, and this was, at the time, I'll come to that later, where we know how a cell looks like that can be infected. So after a cell culture model has been established, and this is uh, the kind of the positive control, um, a virus generated in cell culture, with, which really efficiently infects uh, the cell and replicates in the cell. But when you just take uh, 20, 50 sera of, a, of infected patients and put them on the same cells, you know replication should go on, almost nothing happens. So this is the baseline, the cutoff, and you see a little bit going on, but when you pass it to cells once, everything is gone. So you cannot just take a patient serum and amplify the virus from this in cell culture. That's not as easy as this. This is for many viruses, but not for HCV. And it has been very, very difficult uh, to get a system going, as Alessandro already mentioned, with, uh, mentioned him of my work, uh, to get any system going, uh, going on. And it took a couple of, of years. So as I, uh, so to summarize this, uh, infection of cultured cells with naive virions taken from patients is extremely inefficient and still is, even if you take a primary human hepatocytes, which might be, the, of course, the closest uh, thing you can find to the human body. One of the, um, uh, of the surrogate models which have been developed so far, I don't work uh, with that, and I just want to mention it, are so-called pseudoparticles. Uh, which can be used to study early steps of infection, but in fact they are not HCV particles, but retroviruses, typically HIV particles, which are just loaded with the structural proteins of HCV. And so you can kind of identify uh, receptors or characterize receptors uh, using these pseudoparticles. But you have to be aware uh, it's retroviruses produced in 290 T cells which have the structural proteins. You can't study replication with those. And the two models which have been established to study replication are depicted here. These are viral, modified viral genomes. One is a so-called replicon model. This is the one we established in 1999, um, uh, which was the first model ever to study RNA replication. And it took another six years to get a, a, a virus running in cell culture, to get the whole life cycle in cell culture represented. Um, and these two um, systems I will introduce now in a little more detail. Just technically, all these systems are based on a cloned viral genome. 
and it has been shown by many studies now that due to the variability of the genome, you have to go for a consensus sequence. So you take a consensus sequence from one particular patient, just sequence 10 genomes from a different patient, and you derive a consensus to avoid mistakes which are, might be present in one or the other genome. Most of the genomes, individual genomes might be dysfunctional you have in a patient, and this is the way to get out of that. So this is a cloned plasmid, uh, a cloned sequence in a plasmid, and then you make in vitro transcripts of this cloned sequence and make either viral genomes or replicants. I'll, I'll come to that in a second. And this in vitro transcripts, this should represent viral uh, genomes as they are in the viral particle. So you just generate them in vitro, and it's a defined sequence. That's a major uh, advantage, of course, compared to a population from a patient. And then you just transfect these in vitro transcripts into suitable cells. In HCV, it's mostly HH7 cells, a human hepatoma cell line. And then you, either when you have a replicon, you can measure reporter uh, activity. If you have a luciferase gene, if you have a selectable marker like, like this, you can select for persistent replication. Um, or if you have a virus, you can uh, go for infectious virus and transfer this to new cells to look for infection. So these all these uh, systems we are now working with are based on, on this kind of strategy, uh, cloned genome, in vitro transcripts, and then transfection of these transcripts, and measure replication by uh, reporters or going for infectious virus. So as I mentioned, the replicon uh, was the major breakthrough uh, ten, uh, more than 10 years ago now. This was based on a genotype 1 isolate called CON1. Um, however, uh, when we start with this isolate, and, and we, we introduce, we replace the structural proteins uh, of the virus by uh, a selectable marker gene. Uh, and the idea was if we transfect this to a cell and select with a selectable marker, only those cells would survive uh, which have virus replicating. And this really holds true. We got these uh, stained colon uh, cell colonies. We got a very, very tiny number of cell colonies. Um, uh, from, with this wild type genome. And when we looked at this viral sequence in, in these uh, tiny colonies based on this wild type genome, we found that they had a bunch of, rep of mutations. Each of these colonies having one population of viruses or replicants in had at least one mutation in a certain region of the genome. And when we transferred these mutations back into the replicon, we saw it went much, much better. So in these clones, we had a high level of replication, but this replication, high replication level, was due to the appearance of adaptive mutations in the viral genome. So the virus had to adapt to this cellular environment for any reason. We still don't understand after 10 years how this adaptation works in molecular detail. It's just the fact that genotype 1 isolates uh, require this adaptive mutations in cell culture, and then they replicate efficiently. But the wild type genome, as taken from a patient, just replicates not or at a very, very low level. And this is depicted here in this reporter essay uh, using a, a luciferase replicon uh, and testing different of these, the effect of the different of these adaptive mutations on RNA replication level. So this is the level of the wild type and this is negative control. You see there is barely any replication measurable. When you in introduce these adaptive mutations, you see replication increases and the best results we achieve with uh, combinations of adaptive mutations um, uh, where you get 100-fold higher or 1,000-fold higher replication levels than the wild type. The problem with this approach was, and this was we learned for after years of, uh, of trying to get viral particles uh, uh, with these adaptive genomes, is uh, that this adaptation kind of um, is, um, negatively impacts on production of viruses. So since these uh, genomes don't replicate very well for most, um, we had to measure core release as a measure of particle production. And as you can see, the wild type, although it does not replicate very much, just from the transfected RNA produces a lot of particles and uh, secretes a lot of core. But when you introduce most of these adaptive mutations, uh, you get uh, a strong reduction in particle formation. So this is the wild type. It's like uh, no replication, but particle production but when we have our highest adapted variant, which replicates most robustly in cell culture, we get almost no core secreted. So this negative this adaptive mutation, which stimulate RNA replication, impair virus production. And this kills the entire system if you want to go for a whole virus replication system. There was only one exception, which was one mutation in S4B, which moderately increased replication levels and seems to be compatible uh, with particle production. Uh, this was published last year. Still, this is not enough to get a virus robustly replicated in cell culture. It will not spread. You can produce some viruses, but they won't spread. 
This only changed with the appearance of one particular isolate, which is termed JFH1, which was cloned from a patient with fulminant hepatitis in Japan. So this is for Japanese fulminant hepatitis. Um, this was cloned by Takachi Wakita um, uh, in 2003. Uh, initially, it was shown that it replicates very efficiently without adaptive mutation, and later it could be shown that this genome indeed is capable of producing infectious virus. And this can infect cells in culture as well as animals. The only animal model, by the way, is a chimpanzee or mice, uh, chimeric mice having human liver tissue. Um, and in all these systems, this virus is infectious. So this was the first true whole virus life cycle model. And it was further improved uh, by the replacement, and this is a kind of an ironic situation. So the replicase of JFH1 was very good, but the structural proteins were, were bad, so the virus titles were very low. And when you took the structural proteins from another isolate, this is termed J6, uh, it's getting much better, and you get much, much higher titers. And uh, the chimera probably t pops up in some of my slides. We're currently working is. Um, has a junction point with an NS2 and is termed JC1, and this produces the highest titer, about 10 to the 6 virus particles per milliliter compared to 10 to the 3 with this, this year. So this was now the first model which allowed studies of the whole virus li life cycle uh, in cell culture, and this was available in 2005. And this was just based on this particular viral isolate, JFH1, and still, this is still the situation that is as it is. So when you compare now the replication capabilities of this JFH1 with our old-fashioned CON1 adapted variants, you see the dramatic difference here in terms of negative strand synthesis over time. This is just a time course of 72 uh, two hours, JFH1 versus CON1, and this measurement of luciferase. You see, after 24 hours, you have here for JFH1 three logs of luciferase increasement in signal. For CON1, the best we have in cell culture, we have um, only a two... 100-fold increase over the same time scale, and we don't get any particles out. With this, you can get particles out. So it's still kind of mysterious uh, what, the, the, what, this, uh, what the special things of this uh, um, isolate are, but I will come to that in, in, the, in the next slides. So to sum up the situation in, in cell culture models for HCV, whenever you take a genotype 1 isolate uh, from a patient, you will see that it hardly replicates in cell culture. It's infectious in vivo. You can test it in chimpanzees. It has been done. You inject the RNA into the liver of a chimpanzee, um, and this raises an infection. Um, however, all these genotype 1 isolates, and still this is the case, require cell culture adaptation to uh, enhance replication. But then they are strongly impaired in virion production. The only exception is this genotype 2A isolate, JFH1, which replicates extremely efficiently in cell culture and produces viruses and is infectious in vivo. This is not special for 2A because we have another genotype 2A isolate, this J6 isolate. This does not replicate at all in cell culture, although the structural proteins are very efficient. So when you put this structural protein into JFH1, you get the best you ha we have, and this is what we're working with. But if you take this as an isolate, it will not replicate in cell culture at all. It's, really, it's quite, quite complex, but we were really interested to understand what makes this isolate JFH1 so special to transfer these properties probably also to other isolates and to broaden the view or to broaden the, uh, the, the way we can look at HCV in, in, in terms of cell culture models. And uh, to understand JFH1 replication, uh, the closest relative you can look at is J6 because this is infectious in chimpanzee but does not replicate and JFH1 replicates very efficiently. And this strategy was taken by Vakita's group. Originally, they made chimeras between JFH1 and J6, and they came up with the NS3 helicase, NS5B, and the 3' NTR are the important portions of the JFH1 genome which are required for replication in cell culture. And uh, since we had a long-standing interest, that, that's just the structure of the polymerase, he found that the polymerase NS5B is the most important single determinant. And since we had a long-standing interest in the polymerase, we focused then uh, on the determinants in the polymerase, uh, which are special in JFH1. And we made, to cut a, a, a long story short, in cooperation with Stefan Presanelli in this paper, we made a structure of JFH1 polymerase. And we, what we found is that this has a very close conformation. Uh, the, the polymerase structure is often described as a right-hand structure, and the, uh, the, the um, different uh, domains are uh, named according to that. And uh, we found that the JFH1 structure is closer than others when you look at the, at the hand picture. It has a closer conformation. This closer conformation stimulates 
de novo initiation uh, efficiency of isolated polymerase, and that might be the underlying mechanism why JFH1 is so efficient, because this de novo initiation in cell culture is a limiting factor for HCV replication. The next step was that we were interested in the sequence determinants, um, uh, which are important for JFH1 and for this. We um, made, again, chimeras between JFH1 replicants, where we introduced the 5B polymerase sequence, seen here. So, and then we made kind of sub-chimeras. And to cut a long story short, um, when we analyzed it, these different uh, sub-chimeras, we came up with a thumb domain as the most important single determinant, harboring uh, the, the, the important determinant for JFH1 replication in a replicon as well as in in vitro RDRP activity. And when we did individual mutagenesis of these points, we came up with a series of individual point mutants. But surprisingly, actually, uh, for ourselves, we found one particular mutation, which was very tiny, a valine to an isoleucine, which really stimulated replication of this chimeric replicon almost to JFH1 levels and also the RDRP activity. And the mechanism of this indeed was, we could uh, justify this uh, by a structural analysis also of J6, of the J6 polymerase when you compared this. Um, and here you see the, uh, uh, this region. Uh, this tiny mutation really uh, makes kind of a strong uh, uh, shift in the, uh, in the conformation of the enzyme, which makes a more closed conformation, which then uh, is uh, responsible for this de novo initiation stimulation. And we also came up with a couple of other mechanisms, which makes the picture more complicated. I won't go into detail. However, since this mutation here is conserved in most HCV genomes uh, in, the, in the J6 variant. We are interested whether we might succeed in bringing this into CON1, which is a completely unrelated isolate. And this is what we, uh, that is shown, shown here. So whether this mechanism of adaptation, which is shown for JFH1, can be transferred to other viral isolates. And here, as you see again, a luciferase-based uh, assay CON1 wild type compared to an adaptive mutant. Um, and when we bring in this uh, mutant from mutation from uh, JFH1, this valine mutation, we indeed get also a stimulation of replication of CON1, also moderately, which means that this mechanism which JFH1 uh, has developed to uh, efficiently replicate in cell culture can be transferred to some extent also to other isolates. And the good news is that this stimulation and replication does not go along with the reduction in particle production. So these mutation is tolerable, it still tolerates production of particles, which means that we now have a slightly better isolate, which produces some particles, and we still try to make it even better. It's not good enough. We cannot work with that as we do with JFH1, but we're still trying to, to make this better to have also a full genotype one replication uh, model in cell culture. To bring this complicated data together in a more uh, visual way, just think about all these different uh, genotypes as cars and just take the in vivo situation as a rough landscapes and HCV, the different wild type isolates we have for HCV are cars that are designed to go to this rough landscape. Uh, when you now look at the situation in cell culture, it's very streamlined. We don't have adapt adaptive immunity, uh, the innate immunity is reduced and so the virus does not have to uh, do so many things to, to, to counteract all these, uh, these efforts. And therefore, uh, if you go with these vehicles into this, uh, this scenario, you will hardly find any replication or movement of these vehicles. And our way uh, of thinking is that this adaptation brings the virus uh, to, to a level uh, which is optimal for this situation. So it ran, then runs very, very fastly, uh, but it's not more suitable for the situation in vivo. And in uh, particularly, we, we kind of changed the virus in a way that it better replicates, but it doesn't produce any more particles. So now, guess what I th think is a picture for JFH1? Uh, it's like that. Um, and this vehicle makes it in both directions. Um, and what we try to understand is what's the specialty of this. And, to, and I think we, at the moment, we are at that stage compared to that. There's still a far, far way to go to, to, uh, to make it better. Um, hopefully, we get, we'll get there. However, not all cell culture models, that's now the sh uh, sh to shift gear to the, to the second topic, not all cell culture models are a uh, 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 motorway like that. Um, this only holds true, the no speed limit only holds true for this hepatoma cell on HOH7. 
and subclones, particularly subclones of this hepatoma cell line. HA7.5 is the one generated by the RICE lab. LUNET is the one we generated. Um, typically, HA7, normal HA7 cells, and there is huge variation, I'll show you in a second, uh, go a little worse. And there is a bunch of cell lines, including primary human hepatocytes, including other hepatoma, human hepatoma cell lines, including mouse embryonic fibroblast 293 T cells, which support replication to a low level but not very efficiently. And most cell lines don't support HCV replication at all. Uh, and we are far off understanding why this is. Just a couple of examples. So this is the view on HH7 cells. When you look just at different passages of HH7 cells, we see differences in two orders of magnitude in replication efficiency. These are all generated in our lab. When you look at subclones of HH7, these are actually cured replicon cells, you see also, very, very huge variation, and you see that there is one outstanding subclone. This is this LUNET clone, uh, how we called it, which is 100-fold more permissive for HCV replication than others. I spent several years to identify the determinants for that. I gave up. <laughs> I no idea why, why this is. It's just a description. Um, for entry, the determinants are very clear, and this, this is something we struggled about when, we, uh, when the virus infection model was first established. We found, although replication is very efficient uh, in, in our lunar cells, RNA replication, um, we could hardly infect many cells, let's say 10%, whereas these HH7.5 uh, cells developed by our competitor uh, were fully infectable. And the simple solution was that when we looked at the surface level of the main receptor of HCV CD81, uh, it's very robust in HH7, and in LUNET it's very moderate, and we have several subpopulations with low expression. So in this case, it's simple. When you express CD81 in these cells, uh, you get a full infection of all, all cells in the culture. For all the replication factors, it's much more difficult. Um, and there are, of course, two phases of, of, of host factors in, in involved in viral replication so far. And uh, research is expanding on this. We have several hundred publications on, on host factors, although we understand the mechanism of, of, the, of the views of them. So the, the one side of host factors is host dependency factors. Many of them have been brought up, particularly by sRNA screens. Um, there are also some, some very strange host factors, like a microRNA, which is a proviral factor. Um, the second phase of, um, of host factors are pathogenesis and restriction factors. We also know a lot of, of those which have also been brought up by RNA screens and microarrays. For example, we know that HCV uh, induces ER stress. We know that uh, interferon-induced genes interfere with viral replication and so on. And of course, we wanted to expand our view on host factors interactions like others did also with an RNA screen. And this is the second part of, of my talk um, where I want to spend the last minutes. So what we did is we focused in the screen on human kinases on 719 different kinases, just to go roughly through it. In the end, we, we, we ended up after validation with 13 validated kinases, and these are shown here. And uh, one of the most important, or the, the, the most robust cyst was a lipid kinase, which is termed P, uh, poly, uh, PI4 kinase 3 alpha. Um, and at the time when we identified this candidate, we didn't know uh, that um, eight other sRNA screens came up with the same candidate. So that's, uh, on one hand, a good sign because um, it, knows, it lets you know that this is a very important host factor because it came really up in every sRNA screen which has been proposed. The bad news is that the competition is high on this project, uh, of course. Um, PI4 kinases, uh, there are four different isoforms of them. They convert phosphatidyl inositol to PI4 phosphate. And this is a big precursor of PI45 bisphosphate, which is an important signaling molecule. Um, there are four isoforms of PI4 kinases. Uh, three, two uh, are the Roman 3, and two are the Roman 2. The three isoforms are uh, alpha, which is ER resident, and the beta, which is Golgi, Golgi resident. I don't want to talk about the other ones. Um, the alpha isoform, which is ER resident, is a 230 kilodalton protein. Um, there had been some reports about additional roles of the beta isoform, which is Golgi resident, but we could not uh, get any get data into this direction. So we're interested in three different uh, aspects of this uh, protein. We wanted, of course, to know the mechanism of action, and we focused on its interaction with viral proteins, on the synthesis of lipids, uh, and the, on, the, um, on its impact on the replication sites of the virus. 
first just to convince you how important this protein is for viral replication. When we silence this uh, protein, and this is just a measurement of uh, RNA replication with the reporter virus, when we silence these proteins, we reduce re replication level as efficiently as we do with the uh, with the sRNA directly against the viral RNA. So that means without this protein, you don't get any viral replication. We don't have this effect for a related dengue virus, which means that this, uh, this protein is important particularly for HCV, but not for dengue. However, enteroviruses have been uh, shown last year uh, in a cell paper to be dependent on the beta isoform, which is the uh, closest relative to the alpha isoform. But not, they don't require alpha, but they require beta. Um, so when we looked for the impact or looked for, uh, for, for mechanism of action, we first focused on the replication sites. And as you can see here in IF already, um, this is a non-targeting uh, shRNA uh, as a control. This is a typical view of viral replication sites, although we use an ex expression system in this, uh, in this situation. So this does not replicate because when we silence PF4 kinase, we would reduce replication and could not see anything. Um, so in this case, uh, this is typically what we, what we expect for na naive replication sites. When we silence PI4 kinase, we get big cluster accumulating here for, uh, for viral non-structural proteins. At the ultra-structural level for, with this expression model, we see the same as for the, um, uh, the wild-type replication. We have uh, accumulation of membranes which are very diverse, multi-membrane vesicles, double-membrane vesicles. After silencing of PI4 kinase, the situation gets very different. You see there's huge clusters of membrane vesicles, which might corroborate these huge structures here. But the individual vesicles in these clusters are very homogeneous in size, much smaller compared to the wild type situation, but very, very homogeneous in size. Um, which brought up the idea that the PI4 kinase might act primarily by lipid synthesizing the PI4 phosphate, which might modulate the membrane rearrangements induced by HCV. And therefore we looked uh, what happens to this lipid, to the product of PI4 kinase in presence of HCV. And this is what you see in non-infected cells. PI4 phosphate is primarily located to the Golgi. This is this cap-like structure here. However, when you infect with HCV, you see, uh, this is NS5A, so these are infected cells, uh, that first of all, it seems that the lipid gets much more. This is after 36 hours. And second, the, the lipid gets redistributed in the cell. You find it at other places uh, compared to non-infected cells. We um, corroborated this by a biochemical assay. This is a so-called PIP strip. And in the quantitation, we find that the PI4P levels are increased up to fourfold in presence of HCV. So HCV seems to in increase the amount of PI4 phosphate or induce the PI4 kinase. And um, to get a closer view on that, we also looked for the levels of the protein in the cell, but we didn't find any impact on HCV on PI4 kinase uh, abundance, which means indeed that this suggested that the virus really induces the activity of the enzyme. We also confirmed this in patient material. So these are uh, consecutive sections of, uh, of, uh, of, of frozen liver tissue. This is the HCV negative patient, just using two different uh, uh, antibodies against the viral, viral proteins. However, when you look in chronically infected HCV liver in this liver tissue, again, consecutive sections, you see that there are nodules where you can clearly detect viral antigen. And interestingly, in the same regions, we also see increases in PI4 phosphate level which means that this increased PI4 phosphate level is not an artifact of cell culture, but you really see also, can also see this in infected patients. Um, to get a closer look at this possible induction of, uh, of uh, the lipid synthesis by HCV, we uh, developed an in vitro model based on purified PI4 kinase, which we got from Novartis, and the purified viral proteins, NS3, NS5A, and NS5B, which just um, uh, use PI uh, substrate with uh, radio labeled ATP, li uh, extract the lipid after the assay, and uh, measure the incorporation of uh, synthesis of PI4 phosphate by lipid scintillation counting. And you just use the PI4 kinase with different amounts of viral proteins in presence and absence of a specific inhibitor. And we do get uh, activity uh, of PI4 kinase in this assay, which is inhibited by Wortmanin. When we add uh, NS3 as a protein, we don't see any influence. When we add NS5B, we see a slight increase in activity, but uh, not dose-dependently. But when we 
uh, at NS5A, the viral protein NS5A, we get a robust induction of PI4 phosphate synthesis by PI4 kinase in vitro, su suggesting that this is the underlying mechanism so that the NS5A directly activates PI4 kinase and this results in higher PI4 phosphate levels in the cells. So this is what we see when we knock down PI4 kinase and here we expressed uh, uh, two different genotypes, 2A and 1B. And here you see uh, the silencing controls. This is the pattern P56, P58 of the wild type. And when we silence PF4 kinase, we get a shift to P58, to hyperphosphorylation in both situations for genotype 1 and genotype 2. And when we do the contrary, when we overexpress PF4 kinase, and this you can see here, you see the opposite. So this is the wild type without any overexpression of PF4 kinase. When we express the wild type enzyme, we get a reduction of P58, a reduction of hyperphosphorylation. But when we express an inactive mutant, we don't see any impact on hyperphosphorylation. And this indicates that active PI4 kinase somehow modulates the phosphorylation state of NS5A. We cannot say that it's directly at the moment. There are some hints that it really might directly phosphorate 5A, but this is not, uh, not very clear yet. So to take this together, uh, P58 seems to be repressed by active PI4 uh, kinase and uh, the basal phosphorated form P56 seems to be favored. And this is interesting because uh, I just want to uh, skip, uh, go very briefly on that. The, the region which is responsible for hyperphosphorylation is very, very close to the interaction region we mapped in this triple alanine uh, mutational analysis. Uh, and this might explain how uh, the enzyme kind of um, modulates hyperphosphorylation of NS5A by binding very close to this, uh, to this region, which is uh, important for hyperphosphorylation. So coming now to the summary, um, we did find an essential role of PI4 kinase in HV RNA replication by this RNA screen. We find that NS5A and pi 4 k interact directly via domain one. Uh, NS5A and pi 4 kinase interaction leads to an activation of the, of the enzyme, which results in an increase in pi 4 levels in vivo and in cell culture, but also really in vivo. Um, this might lead, this might be the underlying mechanism of altered, uh, the altered composition of the replication sites, the morphology, which I showed you in the EM, the smaller vesicles, uh, either directly by the high amount of lipid or indirectly by recruiting host factors. However, we also find evidence for a modulation of phosphorylation of NS5A, and this might directly regulate RNA synthesis. But tell me what's the hen and what's the egg. I can't, so we, we cannot really state at the moment what's a direct or what's an indirect mechanism. Um, it might be that everything is linked together. It might be that the phosphorylation is the important thing. However, PF4 kinase might really be an attractive target for antiviral therapy. The toxicity is, might be an issue, of course, whenever you hit a, a cellular target. But still, um, the, the fact that enteroviruses are also require a PF4 kinase might lead to a more broadly, broadly acting antiviral. And the fact that the PI4 phosphate levels in the infected cells are uh, enhanced might point to implications for pathogenesis, which might be induced by this. So just to thank the people involved in this study, um, Simon Reis did most of the PI4 kinase work. Uh, Melanie Schmidt, uh, uh, she just left the lab, did most of the JFH1 stuff. Um, Ines did the EM. Uh, uh, Ilka Repan in Ralph Badenschlag's lab did the uh, sRNA screen. Uh, the pathology in the department in Heidelberg did the liver studies. Um, Stefan Bessanelli, the crystallization. And I want to thank you for, the, for your attention. <laughs>